Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for what is sure to be an engaging and informative conversation featuring two Duke alumni whose roles are directly impacting the health and well being of those in New York City and across the globe. My name is Jen Karani. I'm a member of the Duke New York Board and alumna of the Duke School of Medicine. I'm pleased to be a part of this event and introduce you to today's speakers. The unprecedented landscape of COVID needs no introduction, and I don't have to tell any one of you that this has been a period of tremendous personal and aggregate challenge, as well as growth, and each one of us has many tales to tell about the sometimes very complicated journey. Personally and professionally, I have a profound respect and reverence for our inspirational leaders who are serving as beacons of stability to guide us through this time. Our speakers today are among those leaders who inspire us to find solutions and silver linings, as well as productivity and unity, despite this complicated topography. I expect nothing less of our Duke community members. They make us proud, and we're so fortunate to have them sharing their insight with us today. Many of you submitted questions during the registration process, and those questions were used to develop the scope of today's conversation. However, you may use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to ask a question at any time during the webinar. We'll hold off until uh, the end to respond to these questions. It's now my pleasure to turn the Zoom floor over to Dr. Vincent Guillermo Ramos and Dr. Dave Chapsey for a wide ranging discussion about the large scale transformative events that are reshaping how we are looking at our systems of care and how they are impacting New York. Dr. Dave Chapsey, an alumnus of the Duke School of Public Policy and currently known as the city's doctor, is the 43rd commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, one of the leading health agencies in the world. Dr. Chapsey, Chapsey has led the city's public health response to the COVID-19 pandemic, including its historic vaccination campaign. Dr. Chapsey's private excuse me, prior work experience spans the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, including positions with the New York City and State Departments of Health. He served on the FEMA delegation to New York City after Hurricane Sandy in 2012, was a White House fellow and a principal health advisor to the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Dr. Ramos, a proud alumnus of the Duke School of Nursing, is the 12th Dean of the School of Nursing, first male nursing dean, and first Latino dean at Duke. Dr. Ramos came to Duke from NYU, where he was professor and associate vice provost for mentoring and outreach programs and held academic appointments in the NYU schools of nursing, social work, and public health. He has been a leader in reducing health disparities among youth and Latino and other ethnic minority communities. In fact, he has an active research project in the Bronx, which he'll share more about later. Dean Ramos, we're excited to have you log a lifelong New Yorker and fellow alumnus at the helm of one of the top nursing schools in the country. I will now pass the mic to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Karani, Jennifer, for that introduction. Um, let me first uh, you know, say that it's really an honor to be here with you, Dr. Chotsky. It's an amazing opportunity to connect both professionally and personally. And I know that many folks uh, from the Duke uh, NYU alumni group are really eager to have us uh, kind of share some of our experiences. I uh, was hopeful that we could maybe make a personal connection with our audience and maybe we could start by just kind of talking a bit about what led us uh, to our current roles. Um, and I'm gonna ask that you actually uh, start and then I'll follow and uh, the, the idea is to really make that connection with folks that are here today. Uh, certainly, and I'll just start with a thank you as well um, to you, Dr. Ramos, uh, to Dr. Karani and everyone for organizing this event. I have to say, I've just really looking, been looking forward to it. I think in so many ways, um, each of us uh, is searching for a connection and community all the more so given how challenging the pandemic has been. So thanks for uh, framing the first question very thoughtfully in that vein. Um, look, I, I always uh, describe myself as a primary care doctor with a public health heart. Um, and that's really sort of defined my, um, you know, my, my professional career. Uh, I love to take care of, of patients, um, even though I'm the first doctor in my family. Uh, you know, growing up, uh, I saw many ways in which health was connected to opportunity, whether it was um, seeing my father's, you know, struggle with uh, diabetes or uh, my own experience of getting hospitalized with asthma when I was growing up in, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, and so that always felt intuitive uh, to me. Um, but uh, but you know what? What I was able to get from my medical training was the chance to bring that to bear in a very uh, personal way, you know, for the patients that I was taking care of. But I always remembered that it's not just about healthcare; it's not just about medicine. It's actually about health, um, and that's where I always sought to uh, 
uh, to connect um, my medical training with all of the broader drivers that we know affect one's health uh, and opportunity. So that's a little bit about um, why I navigated the professional journey that I have. So thank you. You know, there's a lot about what you said that actually resonates with me. Um, and as I was sort of thinking about today, I was really struck in reading about you, how much of our backgrounds are, are similar. But I'd like to kind of share uh, a little bit of my own story. You know, I uh, was born in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, and my mother is from Puerto Rico, my father from the Dominican Republic. And to be honest, I, I never envisioned that I would be the dean of a school of nursing. Uh, that really wasn't uh, initially what I thought I'd be doing with my career. But boy, am I, am I glad that that's where I, I sort of ended up and where I am right now. But growing up in the Bronx, you know, at the time I didn't really have a language for what I now understand as, as being social determinants of health. Everybody during that time sort of lived in a similar way to the way that my family lived. And we didn't really um, understand that we were in a context where we had disadvantage, where there was poverty. Um, when I started to travel on public uh, school buses, on yellow school buses into the city, Manhattan, for trips to the museum and to see, um, you know, special outings that my public school really was organizing, I started to, to imagine and see that there was really life that was quite different than what things looked like in my own neighborhood. And it made me wonder why that was. And, you know, initially, I spent uh, most of my career focused on social welfare and trying to understand how people find themselves in these situations where there's inequity um, and what we could do about it from both an individual level, a family level, community level, and you know, systems and policy level. Mm -hmm. That kind of led me to public health and really thinking about the science of public health and epidemiology and I increasingly became interested in uh, how can I, I sort of develop community interventions designed to keep people from developing things like diabetes or what you were saying, Dr. Shotsky, about uh, you know asthma and those kinds of things. But it wasn't enough. You know, I had this kind of ongoing uh, kind of need or this this sort of thought that kept on coming back to me that I wanted to care directly, you know, for 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 people. And for me, it was young people. And the issue that really ignited my interest was sexual and reproductive health. And up until the time that I arrived here in Durham um, in July of, of this past year, I was involved in clinical care as a nurse practitioner at Montefiore Medical Center in the Adolescent AIDS Program, and really excited about uh, my research, uh, some of my programs that have been two decades in the Bronx, and also uh, integrating uh, that into direct clinical practice, that social welfare, public health, and nursing uh, sort of framework. So that's what led me here. Yeah, and so sorry. No, I just want to say I really appreciate your story. And yes, there are there are so many parallels. Um, but the one that uh, that really struck me from your remarks is is you know pr the privilege that we have in. Um, in being clinicians and being healers is bearing witness to so many other stories, you know, that have these common threads. Um, one of the ways that I really think about it is, um, is the cycles, you know, that we see. And they, they can be virtuous cycles or they can be vicious cycles, you know. Vicious cycles are things like poverty leading to illness, which leads to further poverty. Um, but what our task is, you know, in health and in medicine is to turn those into virtuous cycles where you lead someone uh, or you, you guide them at least, you know, on a different path uh, that helps them either regain their health or some other aspect of their well-being. Um, and that in turn, you know, leads to other opportunity in their life. Um, for me, so much of what we have the privilege of doing is observing and bearing witness to all of the different ways in which it manifests. And I'm sure particularly because you took care of adolescents, um, you know, the ways in which that happens very quickly, you know, in many cases, uh, and to, um, to turn them into virtuous cycles that actually improve people's health. Thank you. You know, one of the things that I was really struck by um, in sort of preparing for today, I, I reviewed some remarks that 
you would have made at the time that you were appointed New York City Department uh, of Health uh, and Mental Health that your appointment as commissioner, was this uh, framing of health as being linked to opportunity. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk about that, because that's something that has resonated over my career as well. Thank you. Yes, this is um, this is one of the fundamental, you know, sort of animating forces of my career is uh, the idea that we we have to we have to always dig deeper when it comes to understanding what uh, what produces health and what drives illness. Um, too often, you know, the conversation around health policy uh, has focused on healthcare. Um, you know, we spend upwards of three and a half trillion dollars a year on our healthcare system, which some have pointed out is better described as a sick care system, um, rather than interrogating what, what are those fundamental drivers of health. Um, I'll just share, you know, personally, my, my wife is an educator. Um, she's an assistant principal uh, at a public middle school in Queens, which is where we live here in New York City. Um, there's so many times where uh, at the dinner table after a long, you know, day of work, um, I would come home after seeing patients, you know, and she would come home from being in the classroom all day. And I would, with great humility, um, say, you probably did more for the health of your students than I did for the health of my patients. And that just reflects, you know, the, the limitations of healthcare and medicine as a driver of health. Um, but it also compels us to think more deeply about what it is then that does matter in terms of what, what creates health and why it's so important. Um, and for that, you know, again, there's a lot of uh, kinship that I hear in your background and your story because um, for every patient, you know, I can see uh, some of the foundational events that meant that the loss of health or illness meant the loss of opportunity, whether it was a hospitalization, meaning that someone lost wages, you know, my, I practice at Bellevue Hospital, my patients are taxi drivers and restaurant workers, you know, and house cleaners. For them, if they get sick and they get hospitalized, that means days worth of lost wages. And that affects whether they can able, they're able to buy nutritious food, um, what, what kind of uh, care they're able to give to their children. Uh, so all of these things are so interconnected. Um, and ultimately, it means that we have to make sure that the systems that we are operating within are organized more around health and opportunity and their fundamental drivers and less around uh, the things that, um, that we know don't make as much of an impact. Well, you know, so much of what you're saying, it really resonates with me. Here at uh, Duke University School of Nursing, we are in the process of really rethinking uh, how we train the, the future healthcare workforce, particularly nurses. And I think one of the things, Dr. Chotsky, that it, to me has been uh, really profound in my thinking is, you know, this particular moment that we're in. And in, in a little while, we'll talk about COVID. But before we do that, you know, I feel like there have been many, many large scale, what I call transformative events, things that have really uh, impacted dramatically healthcare delivery. And some of those things are embedded in what you were sharing in terms of you know, what's happening around growing inequality in terms of income or some of the racial uh, divides in our country. I think about uh, migration the, and the US-Mexico border um, you know, issues of homelessness and the sort of substance abuse uh, epidemic, mental health. I mean, there's so many issues that have been so pronounced that I feel that in my own thinking, there is a way in which, for example, COVID, which has been obviously the thing that has occupied a lot of our time over the past, you know, couple of years, uh, it has really been a light on the historical inequities it has had direct impacts on uh, important health outcomes independently of that historical context. And in my view, it's synergistically interacted in ways that it has worsened and amplified, you know, the, the sort of two points that I made previously. And so I'm wondering your thoughts regarding um, sort of what I'm sharing, but also as it relates to COVID, you know, how has New York City been transformed and what kinds of ways 
um, sort of our topic that we're addressing now? How does it play out in a context like New York City? Mm. Um, well, first, I think that's so well articulated. Uh, you know, one, one of the ways that I think about it um, in terms of the different strands that you just laid out is to use a clinical analogy. Uh, you know, as a primary care doctor, I, I take care of mostly chronic conditions, um, but then there are also acute uh, conditions in medicine. So a chronic condition is something like diabetes, an acute one is like a heart attack. Um, and uh, in the same way that the healthcare system is more organized around acute conditions, you know, if you have a heart attack, we know what to do. We have a protocol for it. You know, we know how to leap into action, but we are not as adept at responding to slower moving disasters. And I think that that's true far beyond medicine for, you know, the things that you've talked about, racial inequity, uh, climate change, um, the ways in which uh, homelessness and um, substance use and mental illness and the criminal justice system all intersect. You know, those are the things that we um, that we struggle to come up with the right uh, solutions and interventions for, in part because the time scale is longer, um, and in part because it requires, you know, things that actually work to interrupt those vicious cycles that I alluded to. And you're absolutely right that the COVID-19 pandemic has magnified, you know, so much of that. Um, for those of us who have been working on these issues for years or decades, it's not so much of a surprise, but it has laid it bare in a way that um, I think is very unique. You know, people understand uh, things like uh, racial inequity in a way that I think is very different than before the pandemic. So let me give you some examples from New York City. Um, our experience, and unfortunately this was borne out, you know, across the country, is that people of color, and particularly Black and Latino New Yorkers, uh, were more likely to be infected with COVID-19, and were also more likely to get uh, very sick and die from COVID-19. Um, that has been true, true through the four waves of COVID-19 that we have now experienced. And so the challenge for us is to look at that, to recognize that it is now more visible and apparent to the layperson, you know, to the everyday New Yorker, and turn that into momentum to finally change it, to render unacceptable, you know, that which has been condoned for generations in many cases. Um, in order to do that, you know, we and, you know, particularly the role of, of um, you know, an institution like Duke is to, uh, to, to lay bare our understanding of why this is the case. You know, why is it that Black and Latino people are far more likely to die of COVID-19? Understand the forces that are at play um, and, and then for us to dig more deeply into the solutions that will actually make a difference for that. That's the thing that is very much on my mind right now in New York City because, you know, I, I hope we will emerge from this pandemic sooner rather than later. Um, but even as we do that, we have to take advantage of this really unique opportunity that we have to finally shift things that have not been able to be changed for years or decades before this. Um, making some of the fundamental investments, for example, in the public health workforce, um, you know, for example, in housing or educational system and change, uh, you know, change the nature of those things that have created those entrenched inequities. I really love uh, what you're saying. It's actually, it's music to my ears. And I'm going to share with you um, a little bit about a project that I'm doing now in the Bronx. And so I mentioned at the start, Dr. Chotsky, that I had been working for about 20 years in the Bronx. It's the community that I'm from, and in one community in particular that's been very special. It's not, um, you know, obviously the only community where this is true, but I think it is a good exemplar. So I work in Mod Haven, and Mod Haven is very interesting because uh, on many key indicators in terms of health and well being, Mod Haven stands out, and yet it's so close to you know, the upper, uh, the upper West Side of Manhattan. And I think um, what's interesting about Mott Haven is that in that first wave of COVID, uh, as I reflect back, 
the number of cases, the number of hospitalizations and deaths was, um, was greatest in Mudhaven. It wasn't the only community, but there was certainly a concentrated impact of COVID. And I was sitting at the time at NYU and I was feeling really uh, professionally and, and personally frustrated because I wanted to do something for the Bronx. I was concerned about public housing and the sort of brown and black people that live in public housing, about 100,000 in Mod Haven. And I knew, Dr. Chatsky, that a lot of the national discussion was around community spread. And it was really around uh, strategies in terms of, at the time we didn't have a vaccine, um, you know, how we could behaviorally mitigate. And a lot of that didn't fit with the realities of what I was seeing, what I knew from my own upbringing. And we envisioned this project uh, that I'd love to talk with you about a little bit, because I think it does speak to some of what you were saying about the future of the workforce. So we, we uh, were recipients of a grant from NIH uh, that was really part of what's called the Radix Up Initiative. And at the time, uh, the focus was on testing, but it's evolved to vaccine uptake, as well as behavioral mitigation and reduction of psychological distress among uh, families that have been impacted by, uh, you know, by COVID. And what we did, Dr. Chatsky, is we developed this, uh, what we call a nurse community health worker family partnership. What we're currently testing through a randomized clinical trial, uh, we are recruiting families and following them for 12 months and working with them directly in their homes in New York City public housing. And we go door to door to nurse and a community health worker. And we actually help the families to understand how they can develop a COVID mitigation strategy in terms of testing, regular testing, indicated testing, vaccine uptake for the first two doses and also the booster, uh, reducing the secondary sequelae of you know, the impacts of COVID on the household and the family. And I'm really, I'm really proud of this because it's an example of what I think you were talking about when you talked about how we prevent things. Our control condition is the standard healthcare system and what's available in the community. And I, you know, the study is ongoing. I think we're gonna do better. I think that we are seeing impacts in terms of the families requesting the testing, uh, being able to adopt some of the mitigation strategies, uh, really being able to, to manage when they do in fact test positive on uh, not showing up at the ER, but being able to work with that nurse who goes to their home. And I guess, I guess what I'm trying to convey is that I think these innovative models of care, this way of you know, reaching people who don't come in, scaling things up and being more efficacious, to me, that's the opportunity that I see so often reflected in nurses and in the nursing profession. And so I'm curious about your thoughts about what was effective in New York, what you think about my story and our study. And in general, I mean, I, I think, you know, you are a doctor with a public health heart. Your thoughts on sort of where we should be going. Um, well, I, I love the, the model and I think it's the future, you know, is sort of my, um, the short answer in terms of my reflection of, of uh, the, the incredibly important work that you just described. Um, my, one of the ways that I think about this is, uh, we in medicine, we always talk about seeing patients. You know, when I go make rounds in the hospital, we're, we're seeing patients. Or when I look at my clinic schedule for the day, you know, we talk about seeing patients. And uh, as a public health practitioner, you have to turn that on its head. Uh, I think about the patients we do not see. Um, you know, all of the people who never make it to uh, the front door of the clinic or the hospital in the first place because of marginalization of some type, whether it is discrimination, uh, immigration status, poverty, um, you know, uh, health literacy. There's a, a multitude of reasons why um, someone becomes a patient that we do not see. Um, and then saying this you know, particularly for me as the health commissioner, but for the health system writ large, how do we actually take greater accountability for the patients we do not see? And it requires models like yours, like the one that you just described, um, which means we have to push the locus of care and accountability further into neighborhoods and people's homes. It means that we 
can't ask people to always come to us in you know, the gleaming hospital building or wherever it may be and actually go to people. Um, and look, you and I both know this is not innovative. You know, we're not talking about um, about rocket science here. And all we have to do is look around the world. Models where community health workers, uh, for example, in Costa Rica or, um, you know, nurses uh, are leading these efforts are very, very common outside of the United States. We have to have the humility to draw from those, to learn from them. But the tricky part is figuring out the investment. And that's the piece where we have to take advantage of this moment that we are in, where people understand this in a way that is very different than before COVID-19. People know, uh, for example, because of the difficulties of accessing testing, how important it is to devolve and decentralize you know, models of care. Um, people understand uh, from the vaccination campaign, you know, when you know, we were in the hunger games of vaccination in the initial weeks you know, of our campaign, uh, what it takes to actually build a more robust infrastructure, not just for whatever the next emergency uh, there is, and make no mistake, there will be you know, in our lifetimes, but also for all of those times in between. So this is, this is our moment to actually build that architecture um, which I think revolves around things like a very hyper-local approach, what you described in Mott Haven. You know, we have done uh, in Tremont, also in the Bronx, you know, particularly with our testing efforts, um, also with a, uh, a, a nurse family partnership expansion in Brooklyn uh, here in New York City, and with our vaccination campaign writ large, you know, across the entire city, uh, which, um, You'll have to keep me from going on for too long about this because I'm I'm extraordinarily proud of the scale and the scope of, you know, our vaccination campaign, which has now reached over six million New Yorkers, you know, in the course of a year, um, and saved uh, thousands of lives because of that. All of that requires um, investment. It requires humility for for us as the health department or as doctors to say. We need to step back. We need to put community-based organizations, faith leaders, community health workers, and nurses, you know, at the at the core of this approach and actually build around that. So um, that's what I think our task is as we emerge from the pandemic uh, and create an infrastructure that is strong for both chronic conditions and you know those more acute disasters. So thank you, Dr. Chatsi. I'm gonna I'm gonna in a second, uh, sort of pose a question about the future workforce and your thoughts on that. But I, I want to share a story with you that uh, it occurred to me as you were speaking. Um, so in a 2007, I, at the time I was working at Columbia University, I had recently earned tenure. I was a fairly new and young uh, professor. I had an opportunity to travel to Mumbai, uh, India and spend a semester at Tata Institute. And at the time, I had never been to India. I thought it was an amazing opportunity, both personally and professionally. And I was invited because, um, you know, the folks who, the faculty at Tata Institute felt the faculty would be able to sort of teach uh, students about community health and community mobilization. So off we went, two of us, and we showed up on the first day to class and um, we sort of took naively our Columbia model and started to lecture uh, to the students. We quickly figured out that a lot of what we were saying, I remember visiting a particular community um, and doing a site visit where students had set up uh, a kind of mobile sort of health and well being clinic. And they were, I asked them how many folks they were working with, and they said 150,000. <laughs> and I said, how is it possible that you're working with 150,000 uh, individuals? And they talked about their systems of care and how they were organizing around prevention. And this really elaborate uh, you know, way of knowing what the needs were and triaging and being able to navigate folks to whatever the health center or service was that was needed. And I think you know, that was uh, an opening, it was, a, it, was a, it was an eye-opening experience for me because it helped me to start thinking about the work that then um, has shaped my career. And that led to that community family 
uh, nurse partnership that we're doing in Mott Haven and, and projects like that. And so mm -hmm. my, my question is, I'd like some advice as the Dean uh, of the School of Nursing, um, you know, one of the top schools in the country, our students come from the entire United States and beyond. You know, what does the future healthcare workforce look like in terms of needs and competencies in areas that you think are important in terms of addressing the kinds of issues that, uh, that we're facing now? Um, well, thanks for, for sharing that story. First of all, Dean Ramos, that's, um, uh, it shows your, your humility and, um, you know, again, a lot of resonance. My, my family actually, um, most of my extended family lives in Mumbai. Uh, and I, um, I had the chance actually to do a summer internship when I was at Duke, when I was an undergraduate at Duke uh, in Mumbai as well. And, um, you know, that experience along with through my medical training, getting to practice in places like Guatemala and Peru and uh, Botswana, uh, which is where my wife and I met, but that's a that's a separate story. Um, you know, all of those were uh, were really vital and eye opening for uh, the work that I get to do right now as health commissioner, and really, you know, the vision for uh, you know for what um, healthcare and public health should look like, because it challenges some of the constraints you know that we have put uh, on ourselves. Um, in the United States, uh, whether it's because of the ways in which we've organized reimbursement for healthcare, um, or you know some of the fundamental assumptions about um, about you know should healthcare be a human right or not, or should we accept the fact that some people will remain uninsured? Uh, and I think that those experiences are so vital to expand you know the bounds, like the universe of possibilities. And so, uh, just um, you know, by virtue of, of having you as the dean and, you know, the tenor that you can bring, uh, it's such a strong uh, statement by Duke and make, frankly makes me proud to be an alumnus, you know, that, um, that you're bringing your experience and your vision to be able to shape it in that way. Um, you know, with respect to your question, I'll start by saying my, the, the key piece of advice that I give to students who ask me about um, you know my career and particularly like something that I wish I had known 20 years ago or you know during my training and the key piece of advice that I give people is spend less time burnishing your credentials and spend more time nourishing your convictions and I can tell you that has just been cemented for me in the course of leading uh, you know, the, the COVID response for New York City over the past two years, I have relied so much more on my convictions during times of crisis, and they have been tested. You know, I have been, uh, uh, this is the most challenging thing that I've ever done professionally. Um, and yes, of course, my training as a doctor, my training in public health has been very important. My understanding of epidemiology comes into play, but for the toughest decisions I've made, it always comes down to uh, my convictions. So I'll give you a little example. Um, you know, I started my job in August of 2020. Um, it was actually one of the lulls in the, you know, the earlier phase of the pandemic. Um, and one of my first tasks was figuring out how to help reopen the largest school district in the United States, New York City Public Schools. Um, and there was a lot of controversy about doing this, as you can imagine. This was also, you know, before there was vaccination. Um, and, you know, the, the philosophy and the starting point for that was born of my conviction that schools and education are fundamentally important to health and that prioritizing in-person learning, always striving to do it safely, of, of course, but prioritizing in-person learning was such a worthy mission that we needed to pull out all of the stops in order to make that happen. Um, that was tested by so many corners, you know, by elected officials, by um, labor unions, by the general public, you know, many of whom were, were justifiably worried parents. You know, I'm a father myself and I, I very much understand that. 
But to navigate through all of that, it rested on you know, the strength of one's uh, convictions. Um, so that's the piece that I think is, is, you know, has to be at the center. The values that you inculcate have to be at the center of any pedagogy, um, including, you know, what you, what you are leading at the School of Nursing. And then beyond that, you know, the, the rest sort of flows from it. But, um, but I think the ways in which uh, we take that and give, you know, students the right exposure um, the ability to work in teams, because that has to be the future of how we, you know, deliver uh, and produce health. Um, and then figuring out, you know, how to how to operationalize that that push into neighborhoods and into homes uh, so that we feel accountable for uh, the health outcomes of people whom we're serving. Amazing. There's again, there's so much in what you're saying that resonates with me. So just a couple of interesting observations. So my mother is a New York City retired school teacher, and uh, she lives in the Bronx. She's in Parkchester. And much of what uh, is conveyed in what you just shared are views that I've heard her say time and time again about the importance of education and the role of public schools, uh, not just in terms of you know, the educational outcomes, but really as a mechanism uh, for health, a kind of social and health vaccine for a trajectory that uh, leads people to where you know you and I are right now and even beyond. Um, I wanna thank you, Dr. Chatsky, because I feel like you're an inspirational leader and you're very relatable. Uh, I love the principles and the values and leading through that lens. It's something that, to be honest, um, as I've stepped into this role, uh, even in the short time that I've been here, there have definitely been moments when I've quietly questioned, you know, is this the right decision? Um, I've been worried, I, I've even been scared, you know, do we open, do we close? Uh, is this the right uh, move for our community? Is this, you know, safe to have students working uh, with COVID patients, et cetera? And each time I've gone back to really asking myself, uh, you know, what do I value and what is really driving this and how to make that very transparent for people so they understand how the decision is being made. In terms of our own school and my thoughts about the future of the healthcare workforce, I do want to sort of make a couple of plugs uh, for nursing. It's not that it only is true of nurses, but I think nurses in many ways, um, you know, stand out, you know, not because I'm the dean of the School of Nursing, but because of the sheer numbers of nurses, you know, the largest segment of our health workforce, more than 4 million in the US are nurses. When we think about COVID response, as quiet as it's been, um, if we think of that first year, uh, you know, the, the healthcare professional that was uh, providing the majority of care in ICUs, nurses, think about mortality, uh, nurses. And, you know, I um, can't help but separate uh, from my role as dean um, what that means in terms of training the next generation. You know, the importance of, uh, you know, leadership, the importance of addressing health inequity, the, you know, you called it the, the locus of care in the community. You know, we've sometimes talked about it as locational flexibility and uh, the idea of thinking beyond the very important role of bedside nursing, but boy, is there so, so much more in terms of the contributions that nurses can make. Um, you know, I will say, and this may be, Dr. Chotsky, maybe not the right path. I'm curious what your thoughts are, but I think, um, you know, too often, um, I don't know if there has been a full appreciation of sort of the importance of our public health infrastructure. I think mm -hmm. naturally there's been uh, a pretty systemic undervaluing in terms of financial resources and some real missed opportunities. And I would say that also extends to, to nurses. What do you think? Um, well, I, I agree. I think we're on the same side of this one for sure, Dr. Ramos. Um, my, what I've tried to make a mantra in, in my job is uh, to be very full-throated about this. There is no economic recovery without investment in public health. Um, and, you know, for me, public health, of course, uh, includes uh, nurses um, for the reasons that you've pointed out, the largest segment of the health workforce, and also 
all we have to do is look back over the last two years um, to understand how catastrophic it would have been if we did not have the investment in nurses that we have, but also the opportunity uh, you know, for further investment because of how foundational um, this infrastructure is. Um, we, you know, this is one of the challenges of being in public health. It is invisible. Uh, one of the sayings that I love about public health is that um, public health saved your life today. You just didn't know it. Um, and it's so true because we're in the business of prevention. You know, we are the averted crisis. We're not the ones who come in to rescue, you know, during a crisis, usually. Um, we are the ones who prevent it from happening in the first place. Uh, and so, you know, I think we have to be, again, it, particularly at this moment, much more vocal uh, in terms of pointing out that the private sector depends on public health. You know, if we did not have the vaccination campaign that we had in New York City with um, about three quarters of our entire population fully vaccinated before the Omicron surge hit us, it would have once again overwhelmed our healthcare system. You know, our hospitals were under strain even with that level of vaccination. Um, and so the fact that we did not have to shut down again uh, the fact that uh, you know we were able to save uh, not just lives but also livelihoods that needs to be attributed back to public health to make the case for you know these fundamental investments that need to happen. So there's been a real um, frustrating to me dichotomy between the economy and public health, and this is another thing that we need to explode as a myth in the wake of COVID-19 that actually we need both together you know <clears throat> investment in public health supports the economy and you know as i see every day in my clinical practice the economy in turn uh, helps generate health uh, you know the fact that um, some of the patients that i took care of you know i i remember all too vividly may and june of 2020 um, where my patients were saying look i have no source of income right now my restaurant closed down. No one is, you know, taking their Uber or Lyft uh, anymore. Um, how am I supposed to make ends meet and actually feed my family and pay rent? So we have to explode, you know, that false dichotomy um, and really point out how vital uh, public health is to um, to our economy uh, and create, you know, one of those virtuous cycles that I was um, describing. Wow, you know, you're saying things, Dr. Chotsky, that I, uh, with your permission, would love to be able to repeat because this idea of public health saved your life, you just didn't know it, or this important relationship between, uh, you know, the economy and health, and not just in the traditional ways, but that reciprocal relationship, that it, it is not dichotomous, that it really is quite sort of dependent, and there's a strong relationship and rationale for why we should be doing both. Um, I would love to maybe just spend a couple of minutes, I know we're gonna open up soon for questions, but I'd love to spend a couple of minutes maybe moving a little bit away from COVID. And there have been some other things, at least as I reflect on uh, your career that have really stood out in my mind as being important. And I guess I'm thinking in terms of mental health and the response to the opioid epidemic or substances. And I guess, you know, even more broadly, New York City as an amazing city, probably the world's greatest city in my view. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that now that I live in LA, <laughs> but uh, it's a global city and it's a city that um, there are many lessons that can be applied you know, elsewhere and vice versa. And so I'm curious if there's anything you'd like to share in reference to that. Thank you, I, I really appreciate that. And you'll find no argument uh, from me here about New York City being the greatest city in the world. Um, I, I'll, I just have to share my, you know, I didn't grow up in, in New York City, um, but my wife did, you know, she's a born and bred New Yorker. So she really laughs to herself now that I am the, the foremost advocate uh, of New York City because she had to kind of drag me here kicking and screaming as someone who grew up in Louisiana, you know, went to college at Duke. I said, New York City, not for me. It's the one place where I didn't apply to medical school or residency. 
Um, and now, now here I am having fully drunk the Kool-Aid about, um, about it being the greatest city in the world. But to your question, you know, one of the reasons that I think that um, it is the greatest city in the world is that we don't shy away from the big challenges. And that's something that really pervades the spirit of, um, of New York. Uh, so let me just take, you know, two, two sort of concrete issues as you, um, as you teed up. The first is uh, mental health and substance use disorders. Um, you know, this is something that, again, we've seen COVID-19 magnify the challenges of, uh, but existed, you know, far before uh, there was the pandemic. Uh, and, and particularly um, opioid use disorder. Uh, this is something that, um, you know, it, it makes your heart sink as you think about the families that have been affected, um, the, the people who have lost their lives so often, people whose lives have been cut short by decades as a result of, uh, of, of drug use. Um, and we, it, what I've been saying is that if it weren't for COVID-19, this would be the five alarm fire in public health. Um, over 100,000 people died of an overdose in the United States in 2020. That's the deadliest year on record since we ever started recording overdose deaths. Um, the same is true in New York City. You know, in, in New York, uh, someone dies every four hours from a drug overdose. And these are not faceless numbers. You know, these are our aunts and uncles, our, our neighbors, our, you know, our, our relatives. Um, we must do something about this because it is, uh, it is at a catastrophic level. So it, it belies easy solutions, I'll tell you that. But we do have things that work, you know, particularly what's called a harm reduction approach, um, which to me is, is really about compassion. It's about recognizing that people who use drugs are human beings. Uh, and I know from taking care of many people with substance use disorders that uh, you have to walk with them on their journey. And they're not going to, um, because of the power of the the of drugs, of addiction, of the illness, um, it is not something that can be overcome, you know, overnight or or often even within days or weeks. It is a journey that we have to walk with people on. That's what harm reduction is about. At the end of the day, it's about meeting people where they are and saying that. Um, you know, we recognize uh, that this is an illness um, and we have services and support, you know, to help you get better, to interrupt that vicious cycle. So I'm really proud that New York City was the first place in the country to launch our overdose prevention centers. Um, these are places where, uh, you know, people um, can use drugs safely under medical supervision. Um, their lives will be saved if you know they're overdosing in one of those centers and then importantly they can be navigated to the services that actually help them you know get better um, this is something that uh, is somewhat controversial um, but you know what i always say is that we uh, encountered something very similar during the hiv aids epidemic you know with syringe exchange programs which were also very controversial when they started and that's where it's our role as nurses and doctors and other health professionals to point to the science, to point to the fact that this works, um, and also to, uh, you know, to, to make sure that we are conveying the gravity and the urgency of the situation. So, um, so forgive me, I, I went on a little bit long about that. The, the second one I'll be more brief about, um, but I'm equally passionate about, which is uh, global vaccine equity. Here we are, New York City, we're, we're in our fourth wave, right, of COVID-19, yet another variant. Um, and who's to say there won't be another variant? Um, the only way that we're gonna interrupt that cycle is if we actually achieve um, global vaccine equity. This is part of our responsibility. And uh, as New York City's health commissioner, I feel a particular responsibility because we are one of the most interconnected places, if not the most interconnected place in the world. So as we saw, what happens in South Africa or Europe or China will, will arrive on our shores, you know, before too long. 
And so this is also something that we have to solve. Vast swaths of the world are less than 10% vaccinated right now. And we have to fix that if we actually want to get out of the pandemic phase of COVID-19. Those terrific uh, comments, Dr. Chatsi. I, I really value that quite a bit. Uh, I see Jennifer's back, so I'm not going to uh, sort of go to the next topic. I'm going to stop and uh, and just say thank you very much for what I think has been a really a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Dean Ramos. Thank you both, Dean Ramos, Dr. Chatsi. That, that was tremendous, and I think someone summed it up very nicely um, in the chat forum, just saying this has been such a brilliant yet humble conversation and I can't echo that enough and the sort of swath of, of pride that comes from knowing that everyone here comes from the same you know cut from the same do cloth that you do it it's, gives everyone a tremendous amount of pride so thank you both for your time today and, and you know for everything that you've accomplished for us you know, during, during during the pandemic um so we could go on pretty much forever given the questions that we have so I'm going to try and just use our time um and, and pull from a few different thematics on these um, my first question is for, for you, Dr. Chaksi. So um, I think it's safe to assume that everyone knows we'll be dealing with COVID globally and in New York City for the foreseeable future. Um, and, and to find some, some promise in all of this and, and some you know, motion forward, given, all of, you know, given that we know we'll be dealing with COVID, when do you think that we will start shifting from a pandemic response, you know, masking, testing, school closures, et cetera, and so forth, to one that more resembles a response to endemic viruses such as the flu? Yeah, this is, uh, this is such an important question. Um, I have to start by saying uh, I, I have a great amount of humility in trying to answer this question because I've been living this for the past two years and I have been wrong. You know, I have, um, uh, I have hoped and thought that we might be turning a corner and this virus has proven so wily and formidable. Um, and so uh, that, that is really um, humbling, you know, to confront. Uh, but I think that with that, you know, that, that doesn't mean nihilism or, you know, hopelessness. I'm, I'm actually feeling much more optimistic about where we are um, now, uh, you know, th certainly than at other points earlier in the pandemic. And I do think that our task now is um, to strike the balance. You know, we have we have vaccines that do prevent, you know, the most severe outcomes from COVID-19. We have um, medicines that will also help to avert, you know, those severe outcomes. And we have a huge amount of experience now in the precautions that we do have to turn to, you know, in periods of higher transmission. So our task is to put all of that together to what I think of as, you know, defang the virus um, and shift us to a more, you know, routine approach uh, because uh, because people are at their wits end and I'll, I'll count myself among them, you know, in terms of how much uh, this has disrupted our society. So. You'll hear a lot of talk about we have to learn to live with COVID. My, you know, um, my sort of qualification to that is that living with COVID cannot mean ignoring that people, too many people continue to die from COVID. So we have to keep that in mind, um, even as we do make this shift to, uh, you know, a more uh, routinized approach, which, which I think this is the year to do it. And the final thing that I'll say is that um, I'll just tie it back to the earlier comments about global vaccine equity. We cannot, you know, in the United States or a place like New York City where we are highly vaccinated, sort of wash our hands of what's happening and the suffering that's occurring around the globe. That is also part of our responsibility, of course, from the moral perspective, uh, but also from a, you know, a self-interested perspective as well. No, I think that's wonderful. And it, it's quite well taken that even though we have a you know a sort of breath of relief, it doesn't necessarily mean that we don't need to look around and see who does not, and and make sure that we take that breath of relief to offer what we can to the net you know to everyone else to ensure that they have that same relief. Um, this next question is actually for for both of you, so maybe um, I'll, I'll pose it to you first, Dr. Chaksi, and then Dean Ramos, if you don't mind um, taking the question as well. What lessons from your Duke education uh, have been helpful to each of you in your roles as you you know? move through this in, in leadership positions? 
Ooh, okay, I'm going to try to be brief because this could really, you know, a lot of uh, wistful um, memories could come pouring forth. Um, well, uh, look, I was a I was a public policy major and a chemistry major um, at Duke, and uh, you know, this sort of reflects the both, you know, the the haves that I've had to call upon, you know, in this extremely um, difficult job uh, that I've had the privilege of serving in for the past uh, two almost two years now. Um, it's, you know, that the, we, Dean Ramos and I talked about core values um, and Duke, you know, in a nutshell, uh, helped me figure out what my core values were. Um, for me, you know, it, I've actually gone through a formal core values exercise and truth, justice and kindness were, were the three core values that I realized, you know, were most powerful um, and meaningful to me. Uh, and I've tried to be, you know, deliberate in bringing that to my work, particularly, you know, in this moment of crisis. And then, you know, it's the relationships that I forged at Duke, you know, so many people whom I've learned from when I, um, you know, when I needed help over the past two years, uh, you know, there were um, classes that I remember that sort of came forth, uh, particularly this public policy class uh, taught by Professor Bruce Payne, called Policy Choice During Value Conflict. Um, I encountered more than I, you know, had ever hoped to uh, over, over the last two years. And, you know, it just, um, it equipped me to, to try to navigate that, I hope, you know, in a way that was as able as I possibly could. Wow, I, I actually, uh, again, I, a lot of what you said, Dr. Chatsky resonates with me. Um, I think this idea, Jennifer, of being a Duke nurse, uh, I was in nursing school and graduate school here at Doosan, and, you know, obviously the clinical expertise and the rigorous education, but I, I think it was much more than that. I think the, the commitment to addressing social determinants of health, the importance of uh, this idea of locational flexibility or what Dr. Chosky calls, you know, moving the locus of care to community, to neighborhood, to home. I think leadership and really being able to think in innovative ways, you know, in that first question about when are we going to move from sort of pandemic response to more of an endemic response, you know, I, I just want to offer kind of a perspective, agree with everything that, uh, you know, Dr. Chotsky shared, but this idea of the dichotomy of the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, boy, has that been not helpful, right? I think that much like the dichotomy of health, health and the economy, I think that in some sectors, um, you know, folks who are not vaccinated have been, you know, deemed in, in really negative ways. And just for the record, you know, I am a strong supporter of vaccines and realize that that is sort of the most efficacious tool that we have. However, we need to think about some of what I heard you say, Dr. Totsky, in terms of harm reduction. Is there such a thing for COVID? Are there a set of options that really move from the best option to something that um, is suboptimal, but still isn't a dichotomy. And that allows folks who are along that continuum to think about how we can move forward as a country, as a world, in being able to live with COVID. And so, again, why am I sharing that? And hopefully that was clear. But um, it's because I think Duke helped me to think that way. You know. At sort of the top of the of the set of options is our vaccines, but then we've got you know the oral medications, our monoclonal antibodies for folks that are, you know, infected. We've got our mask, our behavioral mitigation. We have you know uh, you know isolation and social distancing. We have a set of options that if someone chooses not to become uh, vaccinated, which we hope they will. Um, we're not stuck in a dichotomy. And I think that that is something about that mindset is really synonymous with, with nursing at Duke. I think, you know, again, you both are such tremendous answers for tremendous people. Um, and given that we're at the top of the hour, I just want to ask one final question, you know, in part because I know that it's a very quick answer, I hope, uh, or I think, but um, Dr. Chaksi, we know that you know the new health commissioners typically begin their service at the start of the new administrations. Um, you graciously offered to stay over to, to help transition, you know, the entire administration as well as the entire you know public community, which for which again we will say thank you. Um, 
everyone wants to know what's next for you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for the kind words. And, you know, I just have to say it's been uh, ex an extraordinary privilege for me to, um, to get to serve in this role. Um, it's one that uh, I each day um, have felt the gravity of it and, uh, and tried to live up to, um, to the role and the position. Uh, so, so thank you, you know, for the kind words. Um, yes, I'm, I'm stepping down on, uh, on March 15th, and um, here's all I know about what will happen uh, on, that, on that day. I'm going to take my daughter to, uh, to daycare to, to make up for a lot of lost uh, drop-offs and pickups. Um, and, you know, after that, I'm going to take a little bit of time to take care of myself, um, you know, take care of my family. Uh, my folks live down in Houston, and uh, you know they're they're older, and I haven't um, been there as much as I would have liked for them through some health challenges for them. I'll take care of my patients at Bellevue, of course, um, and then hopefully replenished. You know, I'll I'll be on to the to the next big thing whenever that may be. So yeah, but but mostly taking a bit of time and you know metabolizing this extraordinarily intense experience. Um, and then seeing what comes next. So thank you. That's wonderful. I can say that again, your answer resonates quite closely, I'm sure with everybody in the audience. And we offer you know, our thank you for all that you've accomplished as our commissioner and our city's, you know, as our city's doctor. Um, you know, during your tenure, we wish you the best. We wish you congratulations for your very well-earned time that you'll take with your family. And to both of you in this virtual world, your personalities, and again, your brilliance yet humility came through in spades. Um, I am privileged to have been a part of this conversation with both of you. Thank you so much for your time and to everyone in the audience for coming um, and joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.